So let's go ahead and get started. Um, today, obviously, we'll be talking about Spring Batch. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Michael Manella. I'm the project lead for Spring Batch. Um, I'm also the author of Pro Spring Batch. Um, I was also a member of the expert group for JSR 352. Um, you can find me on Twitter, uh, as well as all the contact links for uh, Spring Batch. Um, beyond the video itself being posted on the YouTube dev channel, uh, the code and presentation are already out available on GitHub. So I encourage you to please check out that code um, and the spec. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about a couple things. First of all, JSR 352, which is the batch spe specification. We'll walk through um, what it provides, what it doesn't provide, and how Spring Batch works with it. Um, then we're going to talk about uh, some things beyond JSR 352, specifically Spring Boot um, and how it makes your life a little better with Spring Batch. And also big data and how batch processing and specifically Spring Batch works into that. Let's get started with JSR 352. Um, Chris Vignola, who is the spec lead for this, this JSR, uh, put it this way: that JSR 352 introduces an, ex an exciting new Java specification for building, deploying, and running batch applications. Um, essentially, this was the attempt to standardize batch processing on the JVM. Um, since Spring has some experience in batch processing, specifically the Spring Batch Framework, which has been around for over six years um, with over 35 different releases. Um, we decided to get involved. We feel like we have some experience, so we want to get involved. Um, and we did. This is a breakdown of the expert group as far as membership goes. IBM, who had the spec lead involved, they had two people. Spring had two people, and the rest of this list had one person. So you can see that Spring was heavily involved in this spec. Um, full disclosure, the Spring count of being two, um, that was at the end of the expert group process. Um, I myself was an independent when the, when the expert group started and has have since been hired on by Spring. But from our involvement, um, this was essentially the result. On the left, you see the documentation for JSR 352. And on the right, you see the documentation for Spring Batch. Except in this particular section, except for the word Spring Batch being replaced with the words JSR 352, they are word for word identical. Structurally, JSR 352 and Spring Batch are very similar. Um, let's dig in a little deeper, though, because obviously the devil is in the details. JSR 352 specifically provides three things. It provides an API for building custom batch components. It provides a DSL, an XML-based DSL, for configuring those components. And finally, it provides a contract for how those components are to interact. It's important to note, though, that JSR 352 is a specification and not an implementation, very similar to JSR. With that, there are no implement there are no components implemented with regards to JSR 352. You get those from whichever implementation you choose. Similar to JSF, whether it's prime faces, my faces, et cetera, you, your implementation is what's going to provide the actual core components you're going to interact with. Enter Spring Batch. Um, we just released Spring Batch 3.0 a uh, week and a half ago, I believe. Um, and with this release, we are 100% JSR 352 compliant. Um, to be exact, we are 100% compliant on the SE side. On the EE side, we can't be compliant because you can't execute the TCK without running the full EE TCK, which obviously we can't do. We are currently working with uh, the spec lead to get that rectified so we can address the EE uh, differences. That does not mean that you cannot run Spring Batch in EE. E it does not mean you cannot run Spring Batch in an EE environment. It just means that we have not passed the TCK yet. So let's take a look at a very simple JSR 352 uh, batch job. It's kind of the law that we have to do a hello world, so let's go ahead and do that. Um, so if we take a look, we'll start off with the configuration itself. Um, if you're familiar with Spring Batch, this XML should look pretty comfortable or familiar to you. Um, it, the jobs are defined in XML, just like Spring Batch. 
Uh, you've got a job element, which defines the flow of work that is going to be executed. Within that, the, you can have multiple steps. In this case, we're keeping it simple. We've got a single step. There are two different processing modes within JSR 352, as well as Spring Batch. There is a single task-oriented component called a batchlet in the JSR, as well as trunk-based processing where you read and write. Um, in this case, for Hello World, we're just going to use a single uh, batchlet. Um, and then you can pass in properties into classes just like you can within Spring Batch. If we look at the Java code involved for this, there's two classes specifically. The first one being this Hello World batchlet. You notice that it implements the batchlet interface, um, which, provide, which requires two methods. Um, the first one being the process method. This is where we're going to put our actual work. Um, and then a stop method, which um, is a, uh, provides a hook for stopping uh, long-running batchlets, which we aren't using in this case. In this case, the process, all we're going to do is say, hello, whatever name I pass in. We're passing in job properties uh, via the annotations required by the JSR, so at inject and at batch property, which are both required for, for a property. Um, by doing this, we will get it, the job parameter injected into our batchlet so that it's usable here. The only other class we have for this example is our main class. Um, JSR 352 provides a hook to programmatically launch jobs, but it doesn't prescribe anything beyond that. So we have to write a little main class to actually launch the job. And so in this case, um, I've got a main class. It's got the main method. Um, I'm just making sure that the arguments I need were, were passed in. Um, I'm parsing those out. As you can see down below, we can skip that. Um, and then to actually launch the job, we call job operator, which is something provided from the spec, um, dot start, passing it in the name of the XML file that contains the job we want to launch and any job properties that we want to pass in. It's important to note that the name we'll pass in, in this case, is hello world job, not hello world job dot XML. So if we go ahead and run this, nothing on my sleeve. So I'll go ahead and build this, the project first. And then we'll go ahead and run the job. You notice all I'm doing is executing the star file, um, passing in two parameters. Like I said, the name of the job, um, XML minus the dot XML, and then my job parameter, which in this case is name equals Michael. And there you have it. That is the calling of our bachelet. And then in my main class, I also have it kick out just a little report at the end that gives all the stats that, that are tracked within the JSR. So um, what steps were run, um, their status, the number of commit counts, the number of reads, et cetera. That doesn't apply for this example, but it'll apply uh, to one in the future. One other important note when looking at this specific code is you'll notice I call start, and then I've got this while loop that's sleeping over and over and over. The reason for that is because within JSR 352, all batch jobs are run asynchronously. So I kick it off, and it's run in the background. I then have to have some other type of hook to determine whether or not the job is finished or not. That's what this is doing. I'm literally just looking up the job, the state in the job repository, which is where state within a job a job is maintained, and I'm seeing whether or not um, the job is finished or not. If it hasn't, I, I sleep for a second and check again. Now, one of the interesting things about JSR 352 is although it, the API was heavily based on Spring Batch, 
no dependency injection is required. It is specifically noted in the spec that dependency injection, while the spec was written in a way that allows for dependency injection, no implementation of dependency injection is required. So we don't require CDI. We don't require um, Spring or Juice or any of those. However, the Spring Batch API, which this spec was based on, is obviously heavily tied to Spring. Spring handles all of the dependency building and the construction of the job from steps and so on and so forth. All of that works within the context of Spring within Spring Batch. So because of that, you actually do need dependency injection to some degree. JSR 352 instead decided to essentially provide a DI light option, if you will. So really you get three different options for dependency injection within JSR 352. And the first one is you can specify your classes in line. So in the hello world example I just did, um, I passed in the fully qualified class name in that ref attribute. Um, the framework then calls the no arg constructor on that class and implements that within the scope of a step. There's also a new descriptor, it's called the batch.xml file, um, that allows you to map a name to a class name. So in this case, I would be mapping my artifact to io.spring.myartifact. This allows you to put this ID, this ID in your job definition instead of the fully qualified class name. The construction of the classes does not change. This is purely a, a nicety to allow you to have to not put the fully qualified class names within your job definitions. The third way, as defined by the spec, is an implementation-specific option. Obviously, with Spring Batch, that implementation-specific option is going to be Spring. You can define any of your batch artifacts using Spring dependency injection, using any of the Spring scopes you want, and they will all just automatically work with JSR 352. So let's look at a little more complex example. In this case, we're going to take a file and pipe it into a database. So in this case, again, I've defined my job within the XML file. Um, I'll get to the listener in just a second. Again, this is a single step uh, job. This time, I'm, this is, I'm going to use chunk-based processing. I've got a reader, which is responsible for the input of the job. So in this case, it's going to read in from a file name that I specify. I've got a processor, which in our case, all it's going to do is it's going to take one of the fields out of my file and do a two uppercase on it. So converting the name to an uppercase. Um, and then finally, I've got a writer that is responsible for the output of, of the uh, step. In this case, it'll be writing to a database. This listener I have at the top um, is one of the many listeners that the JSR and Spring Batch provide. Um, they provide listeners for just about every piece of a job life cycle you can think of. So at the job level, at the step level, um, at the chunk level, so essentially commits, uh, skipping, um, retrying, uh, every read, every write, and every process. All of those can be wrapped in a listener. Um, in this case, I'm going to be using a, uh, listen, a job level listener to instantiate my uh, business schema. I'm using an HSQL DB for in memory, um, in memory, so I need something to bootstrap that. And since the JSR doesn't provide anything for that out of the box, I'm going to use um, a listener to do that. So when my job starts, uh, I've got this little listener that will execute my SQL script for me. Let's take a look at the classes here. Um, I'm using the same main class, so we don't need to look at that. The domain object I'll be working with is this customer class. It's a very simple class. It just has a string for a customer name and an int for a quantity. The file we'll be working with, I'll show you in just a second, is a CSV with two columns, customer name and quantity. Um, the listener I'm using is this database initializer. Um, it extends abstract job listener, which the reason I'm extending the abstract version instead of implementing the interface is because this allows me to ignore some of the uh, methods. I only really care about the before job uh, method in the listener, so 
by extending abstract job listener instead of implementing the job listener interface, I can ignore the after job method. Um, I'm injecting in the uh, script path, which is the location of the database script that I'm going to execute. And then this is just the work for actually running that SQL, those SQL statements. Looking at the reader, um, in this case, I've got my flat file item reader that implements reader. Um, I've got three methods I need to, I'm sorry, four methods I need to implement. Um, the first one is open. So this is essentially going to initialize the state of the reader. So in this case, I receive a checkpoint which is saved state from a previous run, if that exists, um, in which case I'm able to reset the state to where I was before. Um, in this case, that would be reading up to the number of lines that uh, I read in the previous run. I've got read item. We'll get back to close in a minute. Um, I have read item. This is the piece that's actually going to get called over and over and over as I'm processing my items. This is the responsibility of this method is to get some input and pass it to um, the framework for, for further processing and writing. So in this case, I am literally reading a line out of a file, uh, parsing it into my customer object and returning my customer object. Once I'm done reading, you return no, and that signifies then the processing. As I'm reading, um, checkpoints will be taken. Checkpoints are essentially a point in time when I save off the state in a, in a way that allows me to restart from that point again. In this case, I'm counting the number of records as I read them, and so I will, um, I'm saving off that. The last piece in the, the reader lifecycle is the close method. So this is uh, an opportunity to clean up any um, resources that need clean up at the end of the step. That's the reader. Um, my processor implements item processor, which has a single method process item. It takes what the reader read and returns another object. Um, in this case, all I'm doing is I'm changing the customer name from its mixed case to uppercase. Finally, we have the writer. Again, I'm implementing abstract item writer. The reason I'm doing that is because in this case, I'm not, I, there's no state to save. Um, if the if, there, if something were to go wrong, the transaction would roll back anyways, so I would start off where I left off anyways. Um, so I don't need to be concerned with resetting state here. Um, so in this case, my open, all I'm doing is I'm getting in my database connection and creating my prepared statement. Write items, unlike read and process, which work on an individual item, write takes a list of items. The idea being that you read an item, process an item, uh, an item, and then you repeat that over and over until a commit count or a commit interval is hit. Once that commit interval is hit, then you pass all of the items within that commit to be written at once. It allows for a little bit of an optimization on the output side of things. So in this case, the writer is going to loop over the items that are received, and it's going to uh, write them to a database. Once the job ends, or once the step ends, close will be called and my database connection stuff will be cleaned up. One thing I didn't point out in the, def the job definition is um, the commit interval here. I didn't specify it because by default, the commit interval is set to 10 items. So in this case, every, as I read every 10 items, it will commit automatically. In this case, I believe I only have five items, so it's not quite that. Yeah, I'm sorry, I've got six items. This is the input file. Um, so since I only have six items, this isn't quite as interesting, although we can do, we can pull this up a bit. That'll work. So now we should have more than one commit at least. So now if I go ahead and run this job, The symbol java.jar, the jar name, the name of the definition file, 
Um, in this case, I'm then passing in one parameter, which is a, a fully qualified path to the input file. There we go. So you'll see, in, I put some system that outs in the reader, the processor, and the writer, so you can actually see that, that chunking pattern. You can see I read, process, read, process, read, process, over and over until the commit interval is hit, so in this case after 10 items, and then I write all the items out at once. I do that again, right, and finally again, right. And then you can see my job uh, completed, my step completed, I had three commit counts, um, total number of records read was 24, total records of write or written were 24 as well. So it's important to note that the JSR-352 does not come with any actual components. You'll notice all the, all the stuff I just looked at, um, or all the stuff we just looked at, all the code was custom code. I custom wrote an item reader. I custom wrote an item writer. Um, that leads to a lot of code that you have to maintain, you have to debug, and you have to test. A much better option is to go along with an implementation that provides components, specifically battle-tested components in, that have been used in production environments like Spring Batch. If we take a look at the same job um, using Spring Batch, things get a lot easier. So in this case, we'll take a look at the exact same file to database job, only this time using Spring, uh, Spring Batch and Spring Batch's components. To start off looking at the configuration, um, this is the uh, my spring dependency uh, injection definition. So this is just defining my beans. Um, what I did here is I have that located in the meta in batch jobs directory. That is where the location where J JSR-352 looks for its job definitions. So by putting my spring definition here, I can then import the actual JSR defined definition, and I can keep them separate. I can keep my spring stuff separate from my JSR specific stuff, so that it's a little cleaner. You'll notice the JSR specific stuff, again, it's just a job, I've got a step, um, it has a chunk, and I'm defining a reader, processor, and writer. In this case, I'm just defining the names because those refer back to the beans in my spring definition, um, and all of the complexities of, of defining those are handled there instead of in line with my job. This makes the job a lot more readable. So if I'm unfamiliar with this job, I can come in and I can see, okay, this is what's going on. If we go back to the spring definition, um, I'm importing that file we just looked at. I can use a Spring JDBC database initializer to initialize my database. So I don't need to write any custom code for that. I'm using Spring this file item reader to actually handle the reading piece. So that's another piece of code that I don't need to write. The only piece of code I need to write for that is the piece that actually does the mapping from a line to a um, to my customer object. And we'll look at that in just a minute. My processor is the same. That's a copy and paste. And then finally, I can use Spring Batch's JDBC batch item writer. Uh, to do the actual writing to the database. Again, this is now less code that I need to write. So for, as far as custom code goes, on the sp using Spring, Spring Batch specifically for JSR 352, my customer is exactly the same. My processor, again, is exactly the same. The only other class I need to create for Spring Batch is this guy. It's called a field set mapper. What this does is it takes a field set, which is essentially my line from my input file parsed up into a result set-like object, um, and I take that and map that to my customer object. So six lines of custom code, that's all the code I need to write um, if I'm using Spring Batch. Everything else from, that we looked at before has been deleted out of this set of the project. It's not needed when you use Spring Batch. So if we look at running the Spring Batch version, 
This should look very familiar. You'll notice the difference here. I'm using spring-based JSR-352 instead of just JSR-352. The parameters, again, are the same. I'm still passing in uh, file to database, which is the name of the uh, job definition, and the file name points to the input file that I'm going to process. The, um, the system outs are slightly different, only because since I'm using spring batch components, I don't have quite as many hooks to put in um, put in system outs. My reader, I don't have a way to put that in. Um, but you get the idea that I'm doing the read process loop over and over. Um, and the commit count, the read count, and the write counts, all those are the same. So functionally, this job is exactly the same, just with a whole lot less code. It's important to note that JSR-352 in the end is a subset of Spring Batch. Um, it provides the DSL, it provides the API, it provides the contract of how they interact, but it doesn't provide components. It doesn't provide a whole collection of other things that Spring Batch does to go beyond basic batch processing. Those things include things like launching jobs. The JSR only provides a way to programmatically launch a job. It doesn't provide any uh, hooks into doing those within the context of a bigger system. So it doesn't provide ways to launch a job from a command line or via messaging or any of those types of things. It only provides one option for configuration, which is XML. Spring Batch provides XML-based configuration. It provides Java-based configuration as well. If you're interested, Spring 4 even exposes Groovy-based configuration. There's no job or step inheritance within the JSR. There originally was, but it was dropped due to the timelines. I've got a hunch this feature will come back, but currently there's no way for a job to inherit from another job or a step to inherit from another step. Type safe properties is another thing Spring Batch provides. Currently, all properties within the JSR are strings. The Batch components are responsible for doing the type conversion from string to whatever uh, type you need, whereas Batch provides some basic um, type-safe conversions out of the box as well as facilities for you to elaborate on that. String Batch provides a ton more scalability options. Uh, JSR 352 provides essentially one, with, or, sorry, two. Uh, splits, which are executing steps in parallel, or partitioning with threads, which allows you to execute the same uh, step over multiple threads. In the end, though, JSR-352 only allows you to use threading as your mode of scalability, whereas Spring Batch provides things like remote chunking and remote partitioning, which allows you to scale a batch job beyond a single JVM. Finally, this is a little bias, but you also get Spring with Spring Batch. All of the things you, are, you know and love and are used to within the Spring in, infrastructure and projects, you get to use out of the box with Spring Batch. I want to pause for a moment and check in to see if there have been any questions about the JSR, JSR 352, et cetera, before I move on to beyond Spring Batch in the JSR. It doesn't appear like there are any questions at the moment, but if uh, if you do have any, now is a good time to um, enter them in. If not, we'll address them again uh, at the end of the webinar. So feel free to just park them in the Q&A uh, control panel uh, of your um, WebEx event center player. Uh, but Michael, it looks like there's no questions at this time. Okay. Moving on. Oh, and just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, Renaud asks, uh, is there an integration of UIMA, uppercase acronym looks like, uh, with Spring Batch? I apologize. I'm unfamiliar with that acronym. Uh, Apache UIMA. Sorry, it is not an acronym. My bad. Uh, he, he clarifies Apache UMIA. I have not heard of that one. Uh, for natural language processing, he clarifies. Ah, um... Nothing directly. Uh, however, that's actually an interesting um, point. 
um, that brings me to an interesting thing we can talk about, which is we recently opened up a new repository for Spring Batch. Um, if you're familiar with Spring Integration, uh, another project within the Spring portfolio, they have an extensions repository that is essentially a number of community con contributed um, modules that uh, aren't directly part of the main framework and don't really belong there, but allow you to allow you to have hooks into other things. I think there, there's a Splunk adapter and there's a, a Voldemort adapter and all those kinds of things in the Spring Integration uh, Extensions Repository. We decided to do the same thing with Spring Batch. Um, we're currently reviewing a couple of uh, pull requests for our first one, but we have opened up a Spring Batch Extensions Repository. And what you're describing sounds like a great um, candidate for, for something to be put in there. We would love a contribution um, if you're interested in doing that. Uh, here's another question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, he's uh, Renaud also asks, will you talk about Spring Batch on Hadoop? Kind of. Um, I do get to big data. We'll get to big data in a bit. Um, yeah, kind of. Um, if I don't answer any specific questions you have, please uh, get them into the chat window and I will address them. The last section of this talk is about big data and batch. So um, if I don't answer your question specifically, I want to. So make sure they're there. Right. And, and you know, it not not because it's it's uh, actually we, we've got a pretty compelling story for Spring Batch on Hadoop. It's just less somewhat the focus of this particular presentation. So, Correct. Um, let's see. And, uh, ooh, more questions. Yay. Um, Al Levy, uh, hope I said his name right, asks, is there an option to connect Spring Batch to use Mongo as a repository? As a repository? No. And there's a reason for that. Um, essentially, Mongo has a little more loosey um, guarantees than the repositories that we typically require. Um, there's been some talk about switching the underlying job repository implementation. Um, right now we use straight JDBC. Um, we, there's been some talk about switching that to using Spring uh, data repositories, which would allow you to do that. Um, however, because of the transactionality of Mongo and some of the other NoSQL databases in general, um, that gets into some kind of hairy option, or hairy scenarios. Um, where you get steps that have rolled back, but the state isn't persisted at uh, consistently. Um, so currently, no. The short answer is currently no. Currently, there's no plans to specifically support Mongo. If we did go down that route, we would probably switch to Spring JPA or Spring JDBC. I'm sorry, Spring Data <laughs> Repositories, and let you roll whatever repository you wanted. Right. Right. Um. Interesting. Okay, yeah. Um, Jean-Paul uh, asks, uh, for my part, we're more interested about the new features brought by Spring Batch 3.0.0 because they're using current version 2.2 currently. Thanks. So I think maybe more of a comment, actually, than a question. So I think we're good. Okay. You can, you can, you can continue. All right. So the next thing I want to talk about is Spring Boot. Um, if you haven't used Spring Boot for any projects in general or specifically Spring Batch, I highly recommend it. Um, as part of Spring Batch 3.0, we decided to remove the archetypes. And you'll notice I, I use archetypes in quotes here because it never really was a true Maven archetype. Um, it previously, uh, in Spring, 2 .2, Spring Batch 2.2 and previously, we provided essentially an empty project with a POM file and uh, the definition for a file to database job um, to get people started. Um, however, Spring Boot makes that way easier and is frankly the right way to be developing Spring applications in my opinion. So because of that, we removed the archetypes out of there in favor for using Spring Boot. If you aren't familiar with Spring Boot, Spring Boot is essentially Spring opinionated. Um, over the years, Spring has gone out of its way to be unopinionated. If you want to use um, tiles with struts with 
um, Ibanis in your project, go for it. If you want to use <laughs> Timelink with Spring MVC with Spring Data JPA, go for it. We don't that care. Was a good, that was a good example. Thank nice. <laughs> The, the, but there's two problems with being unopinionated. Number one, you have to take the time to make those decisions. And number two, once you've made, made those decisions, you need to then piece all these pieces together. That takes time and slows down the getting starting process. Spring Boot's thoughts were, what if we came up with some sensible defaults out of the box and then applied some additional defaults that made sense based on your environment? That could speed up that whole process. So we did that, and, and the result is that Spring Boot essentially makes the startup process significantly easier. We do things like now, um, before, if you wanted to write to a database, you had to configure a data source and then manually wire it or using AutoWire it if you wanted, but wire that into all of your beans. Well, we can look at your class path and see, okay, you've got DBCP or Tomcat connection pool on your class path. If you can tell us what the properties are, the database URL, username, and password, we can figure out that you want a data source using that stuff. And if we see in your objects that you need a data source, we can give that to you without you telling us to. So that's essentially what Spring Boot does. Is it, it analyzes what's, what your environment looks like and says, you know, here's what we think you're asking for. If, you, if we're wrong or if you don't like what we're giving you, we get out of the way very easily. You can easily override any of the defaults that we, that we, um, that we offer. So the idea is the opinionated to start, get out of the way uh, quickly and easily. Um, one additional note about Spring Boot is there is no code generation. Um, it is all um, dynamic runtime stuff. So a common question is, is how is this different from Spring Roo? The easy, quick answer is Spring Root, code generation, Spring Boot, no code generation. So let's take a look at the same file the database example again with some stuff on top of it. We're going to use Spring Boot to run it, so to handle some of the niceties. We're also going to add in a messaging piece. We're going to add in a piece to launch the job via message, and then we're going to have the job report back its status via messages as well. Um, so when the job starts, it'll send a message. And when it finishes, it'll send a message with the status. Um, and the source of these messages and the destination of these messages we're going to use is Twitter. So to launch our job, we're actually going to tweet. Um, our job will be pulling Twitter, looking for that tweet. When it gets to tweet, it will kick off the job. And then as it progresses through, it will tweet for us the status of, of the job. The, compo the, new, the new, and I use that in quotes, components um, that I'll be using for this are the components found in Spring Batch integration. This is a sub-project that was previously found in Spring Batch admin, um, but has since been promoted to, to the actual Spring Batch project. So if you have used Spring Batch integration in the past, you'll note that the location of the artifact has changed. Nothing else in it should have. Um, just the location of the artifact. It's finally been promoted up. So let's take a look at that example. So in this case, um, there is no XML, actually. Um, I'm going to be using Java configuration for everything. We'll start off with our main class. Um, we need some point to start off, and Spring Boot makes that pretty easy. Um, in this case, this is the whole main class. I'm using component scanning and integration component scanning, which is the Spring integration equivalent, um, which adds on some additional niceties uh, for Spring integration, to find my configuration classes. And then enable auto configuration is what provides the Spring Boot magic, if you will. Um, the only other Spring Boot piece I'm using in this class is the Spring Application class. Um, it's always been more of a pain to launch uh, main class 
spring apps. We've had hooks for web apps and whatnot, but running a, a plain command line app has always been a little tougher than probably needed to be. So the spring application provides that functionality out of the box now. So with that, it's, we're going to find two configuration files or classes. The first one is our batch one. Um, you'll notice I've configured configuration, and I've also added the enable batch processing annotation. This provides a laundry list of batch needed components to your context out of the box. So it provides um, these two factories, the job builder factory and step builder factory, which we'll use to actually construct the job. It provides step scope. It provides a job repository, um, a job operator, and a whole bunch of other things. Working through this uh, configuration class, um, we're using a the same reader, writer, and processor. I'm sorry, we don't have a processor on this one. Um, but the same reader and writer, uh, just configuring them with Java config instead. So this is a reader. I'm taking the file name as the parameter, just like I was before. Um, and then I'm configuring um, my flat file item reader. Um, you'll notice my flat file item reader is step scoped because it's taking in a job parameter. Then I'm using the JDBC batch item writer. Again, this is the same writer I was using the XML configuration, just via Java configuration. Um, so pretty much it. I then build my step. So in this case, I get my data source. I build my step, step builder factory. Um, I get my step. I set my chunk interval. In this case, I've got it to five instead of 10. Um, I'm creating my reader, but my writer. Um, and then I call build, which returns the step. Finally, I create my actual job. So job builder factory dot get the job name. Um, I'm adding on a listener, which we'll get to in my other configuration. That's going to provide the status updates as we go along. I define step one as the place to start, and that's pretty much it. So that's it for the batch configuration. Now let's take a look at the integration side. So on the integration side, I've got this component. Um, I'm injecting the four uh, security pieces that um, I need to connect to Twitter. Um, those are located in my application that properties. Sorry for those who are interested, and I'm not going to show you guys that file. Um, there is, in the readme, um, there's an example of what it needs to look like. You just need to drop in your values. I'm using the Twitter template out of the Spring Social uh, project. So that takes in the stuff, and that's what actually does the work of dealing with Twitter. Oops. Um, below that, we start configuring the actual Spring integration stuff. Um, so in this case, this is going to be my inbound channel adapter. This is going to be pulling Twitter for the message that I'm going to receive to launch my job. I've got some channels to find, um, and then I've got oops. Like I said, I've got some more channels to find. I've got my yeah, my property persistent meta data store. All this is used for is to prevent me from downloading the same tweets over and over and over. This will keep track of the tweets I've downloaded in the past. Here's where we get into the actual spring batch piece of it though. The message laws launching message handler. So what this is going to do is this is going to accept a message from, um, from a channel and launch a job based on the information within that request. The domain object we're looking at is exactly the same, um, so nothing new here. Um, the listener I'm using is this job status uh, listener. Um, it extends the job execution listener, so that's the Spring Batch regular listener interface. The only reason I'm extending it with, uh, with this interface is so I can override these methods so I can use annotations to configure them. Um, essentially what I'm doing is um, I'm turning this listener into a message gateway, so when these methods get called, whatever I call them with is going to be put on a channel and sent off as a message. The reader, this is the exact same code from the reader, uh, from the spring example from before. Then there are a couple um, spring integration components that I've added for this. I've got a tweet filter. 
this is a spring integration filter. What this purpose is, is obviously with any Twitter feed, you can get more than just what you post on it. So if you're following people or whatever. So in this case, I'm just searching for the, uh, for the tweets that match a certain pr uh, pattern. If those match, I pass them on to launch a job. If they don't, I filter them out. Of the tweets that get through that filter, I then need to transfer the, or convert the tweet object into the job launch request object. So this is going to take the text from my tweet and convert it into something that Spring Batch knows how to launch a job from. So in this case, all I'm doing is I'm taking the job name and building the parameter list and creating this job request object and passing it on. This is what the job launching request hand, or message handler knows how to use to launch the job. That's it on the incoming side. On the outbound side, um, when, those list, when that listener is called and it passes in the job execution, this is going to convert the job execution into a tweet data object, which will later be converted into a tweet. So in this case, I just get the um, job name and I say it's either started at the time or it's completed with the status of whatever the current status is at the current time. So that's really it. Let's go ahead and kick this guy off. Building again. Not quite sure it was different, but so it goes ahead and starts up. And it started, now it's listening. And now this process is just going to sit there. So now let's go over to Twitter. And unfortunately, Twitter has this goofy issue of not allowing duplicate tweets, or not allowing duplicate tweets within a certain time period, I guess. So I'm just adding this one equals two or whatever at the end to make it a unique tweet. Um, but the tweet I'm actually sending is file to database. That's the name of the job I want to run. And then file name equals and then the fully qualified path to the file I'm going to process. So I go ahead and tweet that. But the process is polling once a minute, so there is a bit of a delay here. Now, the reason it's polling once a minute is due to the Twitter API uh, limitations. I don't want to overdo it. But as you can see, it was picked up. Um, so processing so processing that tweet, creating a request. That was the job and the parameters. Um, it was launched, and you can see it was completed. Um, with that, it also then tweeted two tweets. So the file, there the Job was started at this time, and then it was completed um, at that time. You'll notice that filter still received those other two tweets and filtered them out. So we didn't relaunch the job. Since the big data piece isn't uh, that long, I'm just going to plug ahead unless anybody has any objections. Peter, I'm assuming you'll let me know if there are any objections. I object. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're fine. You're fine. Right. Um, okay. No questions at the moment. And um, yeah, no, you're, you're fine. Okay. Big data. Um, batch processing obviously has a, has a role within big data. Um, and 
Spring has been working hard on, on that piece, uh, specifically with Spring XD. Uh, Spring XD is our attempt at making big data simplified. Um, when we think about big data from a bigger perspective outside of just Hadoop, um, we have data stored all across our enterprise. We've got it in databases. We receive it, whether it be via sensor data or web services. We've got it just stored in other um, other applications on servers across our enterprise. We need to get all that data into something that can process uh, that information collectively. Um, typically, Hadoop, uh, Gemfire, pick your big data data store. Um, we do our processing there. Then we need to actually move that data off of Hadoop or Gemfire or wherever into something that actually we can uh, interact with in a little more meaningful way for our dashboards and whatnot. Spring XD is designed to handle essentially everything this circle covers. It handles ingestion of data from all those points on the left into your big data store. It handles orchestration uh, of the processing on that big data store. It handles extraction, so once that processing is done, getting it out of that big data store, all with real-time analytics. Um, but like I said, big data um, is heavily batch oriented. You hear a lot about things like Spark and other streaming APIs, but in the end, the most efficient way to, hand, to process large volumes of data, like when we're talking gigabytes and petabytes and et cetera, those, the most efficient way to handle those is via batch processing. And Spring XD allows you to run batch jobs on, um, on uh, big data, uh, on Hadoop and other big data platforms. So let's look at an example of running a batch job using Spring XD. Um, the batch job we're going to run is actually going to pipe a file into HDFS. Um, so to get started, I'm going to be using the latest milestone that just came out. Actually, I'm going to start Hadoop first. So we'll start off with really quick. Group started. And you'll see the XD directory is not there, so I'm starting clean. So now if I do Spring XD supports just about every Hadoop distribution out there. Um, I'm obviously working with a local copy of Hadoop, and it's an old version I haven't updated yet, so I had to specify um, what the version is. But um, like I said, it works with any version of Hadoop that uh, Spring for Apache Hadoop works with. So Spring XD is now running, so if we go to So this is the admin UI for Spring XD. Um, out of the box, you get a number of job uh, jobs ready for you to run. All you need to do is pass in your configurations and run them. So in this case, we're going to run the file poll HDFS job. What this does is it's going to read in the file and pipe it to HDFS for us. So to do that, first we need to create a definition. So we're going to call this File to HDFS. Um, the, the names, most of these properties we can ignore for this example. The names are going to be the names of each field within our CSV. In this case, we're using the same CSV, so it'll be customer quantity. Um, and I believe that's all we need to specify for this. The UI, the, the um, web interface is not the only option for interacting with Spring XD. There's also an interactive shell that you can work with. If I was working with the shell, I would be pasting in essentially this um, job definition string into it um, if you wanted to work that way. 
So I've created my job definition. By default, it deploys it automatically. If you don't want it to deploy it automatically, you don't have to. So we go to our deployments. That's an old one. I'm looking at an old database. <clears throat> to me. But I want to launch this one that's only just created. So if I need to pass in one per job parameter. That is the um, parameter for the um, for the file name itself. So absolute file path is the name of the parameter, and the value we're going to pass in is temp forward slash customer.csv. Um, all this information is available in the README in the GitHub repository uh, that all this code and presentation is available at. So if we launch a job, so it's completed, it's a quick job. And then if we go back to Hadoop, now we can do, now all of a sudden we have something there. This is our file. Oops, one of those, one of the tail. And it has our six records. Pretty straightforward. Um, unless anybody has any questions, that's all I have. Um, these are the links for Spring Batch Boot and Spring XD. Um, obviously, keep in contact. Um, I leave it. Yeah. Um, so, folks, uh, now is uh, now is the time to enter in any questions you have. Um, one thing that uh, I thought might be interesting to know, Michael, was that before when um, you you mentioned the Spring XD shell, um, mm -hmm. and I think. Uh, it's important to, to to for people to realize that 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 is a um, that's an Im important uh, part of the value of, of, of XD. Uh, it's an optional one, as you said, right? But an important part of the value of XD in that you can use this sort of kind of Linuxy uh, pipes and filters, uh, you know, domain specific language sort of syntax, uh, and and not even have to sort of code. Uh, as a way to to use Spring XD and transitively sort of you know using Spring Batch under the covers depending on what types of jobs you define, um, but uh, you know that that that's an option for for people that aren't even Java developers really. Um, Correct. But you know, uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, of course, you know, it, once you get to extending XD and and you know, kind of going beyond what uh, is is supported out of the box, then you know, yes, you are probably back in in, in Java code. So, um, but uh, it can it can be made uh, to be completely DSL driven and and code free, um, especially if you know you're working with other uh, Java programmers and you know you need to write a Spring integration channel adapter, for example, to, to talk to help XD talk to some proprietary or unique system that you have, right? You know, uh, engineer A can do that. Uh, and then leaving engineer B, you know, just to be able to have to learn the DSL and work at command line only, not even compile code. So um, it's actually, it's actually amazing how little, how infrequently you actually need to write uh, XD Java code. Um, I'm going to be giving a talk at OSCon um, in two months on building a recommendation engine using Spring. And the main piece that doesn't have you listing is Spring XD. Mm -hmm. There is, I believe there's no Java code for any of the Spring XD pieces, and there's only about 30 lines of custom XML. That's it. Wow. For the entire nice. recommendation engine. Wow. Everything else is out of the box. So um, if you're going to be at OSCON, check it out. Uh, or Spring 1, too, I think, yeah? Yes, yes. I uh, will be giving the same talk, actually much bigger, or much or more elaborate, or elaborated at Spring 1 as well. Awesome. All right, folks. Well, listen, if you have uh, questions for Michael, uh, now's a great time to enter them in. Um, while um, we're, we're waiting for any questions to come in, I will uh, just quickly remind everyone that uh, this talk is being recorded. Um, if you'd like to share it with your colleagues, uh, if you have a colleague that you think might want to see it, um, we try to 
post the replay within two weeks. Uh, often we do it much faster than that. Um, and you can, if you want to get notified about uh, the recording uh, being available, uh, you can subscribe. You can go to spring.io forward slash blog and you can subscribe to the Atom feed there um, because we always do a, a post there when, when the replays are available. Um, and, of course, then you'll get lots of great blog content and Spring 1 replays and you know uh, free educational videos, all kinds of good stuff like that. Uh, all the great content that comes in through the engineering blog. Um, and if you just, however, for some reason, you just kind of are more curious about videos or you just want a notification about the uh, webinar only, uh, you could also subscribe to our Spring Source Dev YouTube channel if you wish. Um, and uh, I'm just going to pop those URLs here into the um, Q&A panel for you in case you're, in case you're curious. Uh, I'm going to send them as a response to um, Renault's questions earlier. Um, and spring.io slash video. Great. Um, so you can use either of those to become aware of the replay. Um, and uh, we're going to have some exciting webinars coming up um, in the following month as well. Um, our our uh, June webinars are here. So um, check the uh, uh, check spring.io forward slash blog uh, for uh, some more of those. Um, we're going to be looking at... Um, uh, we just did Spring Cloud uh, with Romnivas and... Uh, now, now, you know, thank, and now we've got uh, Michael's Michael's talk. We've got a couple of others uh, tagged up for for June. So just as I said, go and check the Spring.io uh, forward slash blog, and you can see what the um, webinars for the coming month are. So we hope to see you come back to those. Um, and it doesn't look like we have any more questions at the moment, and we are four minutes uh, past the hour. So uh, perfect timing, um, Michael. If there's anything you kind of want to say in terms of wrap up or conclude. Um, Let's uh, let's wrap it up. All right. No, the only things I wanted to say are uh, thanks everybody for coming and uh, please check out uh, both the source code on GitHub as well as um, the regular source code. I can't encourage people enough to get involved in these projects, whether they whether it be Spring Batch or open source in general. Um, it's a great uh, thing, not only personally because you're giving back, but also from a career perspective. So I highly recommend getting involved in open source in general. Great. Thank well, thanks, everyone. I uh, appreciate your time, your attention, your questions. And we'll see you on a webinar again very soon. Uh, thanks for coming. Have a great day.